What I want to talk to you about today is deliberately challenging. Um, and it's deliberately challenging because I have some serious concerns with uh, that what we are doing as big data analysts, and I'm a big data geek, right? I belong to uh, various international research consortiums that like to share data um, and want to share data. But I'm really, really concerned that we aren't going to deliver. And we aren't going to deliver in a way that is not only not are going to benefit everybody, and I mean everybody, it'll benefit some, um, not only will it not benefit everybody, it'll actually undermine the very foundation and justification that we use to do the work we do. And if we don't deliver, right, and if we don't make um, things better, and in fact if we make things worse, then the funding bodies aren't going to want to fund us, and the people aren't going to want to share their data, and it's game over. So I don't want that to happen, <laughs> okay? I can see some real benefits from this, but I think we need to go in to what we do with an air of caution and an air of expectation that good things won't just happen spontaneously. We're gonna to have to make them happen. So on that, if anybody tells you natives don't do data, not only do we do it, we did it first, right? This guy, Tarangi Hiroa, otherwise known as the Peter Buck, from Ngāti Mutunga, um, little iwi who got completely hammered um, with confiscations and land theft, but produced some remarkable leaders, um, excuse me, <laughs> including Edo Komari, who I worked with. Not only was he a politician and New Zealand's first Māori trained doctor, he actually wrote the first epidemiological article of any sort that was um, done in New Zealand, and it was published in Australia in 1914. And just to go to show that nothing really changes, even if you do do studies, it was on the impact of housing on Māori health. <laughs> 140, uh, 104 years later, of your research on outcomes for Māori, are we there yet? Well, sorry folks, there's been lots of improvements. But even the equity and the most basic metrics like mortality and preventable mortality aren't there yet, right? There's been some fantastic improvements of the data and a lot of that we have to owe Paparangi's advocacy and even getting the Ministry of Health and, and the Crown to count us at Māori properly when we die is something as fundamental as that was her advocacy in the 1990s that made that happen. There has been some um, improvements in absolute terms, but and those improvements has, have especially happened where there's been really focused efforts like in women's health, um, cervical screening and breast, breast screening. But in relative terms for the population, it ain't so flash. Now, I am starting with a bad news story, and there are good news stories, but the reason I want to, want to tell you about these bad news stories is we've had the data about this stuff for a long time. And if you look at um, all-cause mortality for Māori, um, the trend is in the right direction, but it's pretty damn slow. But the Māori death rates are still 1.8 times higher from, um, than non-Māori. So, yeah, is that due to the health care system? Well, um, yes. Right. Here we have uh, some information, that, uh, some fantastic study done by Sarah Hill and um, Dice Safati and team, Tony Blakely. Uh, Tony was about two years behind me at medical, uh, sorry, at, at school, and he's been a full professor for about 15 years, and I haven't, but I'm not bitter. Um, <laughs> anyway, the persistent differences, um, what would this shows, and this is a, a disease that we, Māori, we have lower rates of, but we die more frequently from. So investigating that was a classic case of looking at uh, clinical pathways, and what they found was that inequity is not just at the outcome, it was at every single little clinical step. Right? And what made that visible was actually looking at the data. But at that stage it wasn't routinely collected data, they actually had to go through patient record files. So it was lots of small differences, but surely those health um, systems effects are decreasing. Um, no. Or if they are, they're very, very slow. Slowly. So this is um, Edel Pomadi and Neil Pierce's definition of a minimal mortality, which is tighter than the Ministry of Health's definition, at 17 conditions like appendicitis that should not kill you, right? Absolutely should not kill you, given even basic fundamental levels of health care. And still, right, in the most recent data that we have, Māori rates are still two uh, about two times higher than non-Māori. So that's a major indictment on our health care. And I want to stress this, 
This is data that we have been collecting. This series actually goes back to 1975. This is not complicated data. This is not complicated analysis. It uses a technique called division, right? <laughs> okay, it is, it is not rocket science. And still things remain the same. And that's my challenge to you. Just because we've got better toys, just because we've got better ways of playing with them, doesn't necessarily we've made, we're going to mean, uh, make a difference because we can't even get the basics right. And what we do know, and this is some work that's yet to be published, is those inequities have massive regional differences in New Zealand. So this is those preventable deaths um, across, the, across the regions in New Zealand. Now, all of this stuff is not only routinely collected, but uh, is, is routinely collected, but it's not routinely reported. It hasn't been until uh, Pakarangi and a few others in this room um, instigated the, um, the Treaty of Waitangi claim on Māori health outcomes that the Crown, for the first time, did a comprehensive assessment of, um, of inequity of outcomes in healthcare delivery in New Zealand. Right. We've been, they've been here for... 164 years, and we've been collecting really good data like this um, since 1948, um, and it's, that, it's taken a treaty claim to get that comprehensive work done. So, we now have lots of really cool data, and I'm really looking forward to it, but is it necessarily going to deliver? Now, if you haven't read that book, you need to. Um, it's a really good introduction. There's been later, um, later books. It's easy to read. I can even get my um, stage one students to read it. But basically, one of the things that Cathy says is that big data can increase inequality and it threatens democracy because it's disempowering. Now, she says that the, trans, uh, the solution is transparency. Myself and a few others say, well, it's actually, that's necessary but not sufficient. What we need is some other things, and those other things are engagement. We need explicability. We need to explain what we're doing and the results of, of what we've done to the people who have provided us with the data. And we need to make sure that they are um, the results and the benefits of those results are actually accessible to everybody. And for me, that's just elements of due process. So New Zealand, what does that mean in a New Zealand context? And um, this fantastic man, um, very insightful, um, was with me when we were talking at an algorithms conference, and he basically, he stood up and said, "Well, actually, analysis should be um, and models should be informed by just as much as by what what is not in the data, by what is in, as by what is in the data." So, and in an indigenous context, that makes life a little bit tricky for us because we're trying to do indigenous um, development and advancement and flourishing using data that's actually been created for another purpose quite often by a government entity that hasn't necessarily had our best um, outcomes, historically, in mind. In fact, if anybody wants to know why the road south goes where it does, out of Auckland, that was actually informed by the census. And it was early censuses were used to inform where the best Māori um, uh, farms were, and that military road went straight to them. So if some Māori are a little bit uh, cynical about um, official statistics and their use, don't forget that we've actually had about 140 years of being repressed by them. So what does that mean in terms of advancement? Now, I'm really keen on Māori, um, as are some others in this room, about using uh, data to inform Māori advancement, but we actually have some limitations. And if, rather than you reading all Mason Jury's seven books, I've done a very brief sum summary for you. If you're looking at best outcomes for Māori, he divides it into two, right? One of universal outcomes, outcomes for everybody, and outcomes that are specific for Māori. And in those, we have individual level um, outcomes and, or national level outcomes, but for Māori specific outcomes, that can have an individual level, whānau, hapu, or nation level. Now, under that, we actually have some um, advancement goals, which he divides in terms of individual and whānau development, strength, uh, social development, economic development, and cultural preservation and, uh, and development. But the problem is almost all of the data that we've got to play with is that. And it's not ours. So, what do we do? Well, there's a few things that we do, and there's a couple of people in this room who know more about this than I do. Um, but one of the things is that one of the limitations with the existing data is we actually require Māori descent information. We identify ourselves, as you heard this morning, um, by 
the fact by our genealogy and who we are by descent. And we need some of that information, at least our identifier by descent, um, within some of the databases. We're trying to do that at the moment with the cancer registry. So I've been involved with uh, the CDH1 genetic uh, cancer project for 25 years, and we're trying to turn the can current cancer registry into working with Māori ancestry data, and it's not working very well. But we think we might be able to get it done there sh uh, shortly. There are very few Māori um, defined measures in the, in the available statistics, and most of those measures that are there are deficit-based measures. Right? That, that thing's going wrong, because you don't deal with a lot of government agencies when things go right. right? Um, and they are quite often ignorant of some of the very serious cohort and regional differences about what's going on. You cannot understand about the health of old Māori men, excuse me, <laughs> just, um, old Māori men, and, um, who are, or men who are about to enter retirement age, unless you understand what the incarceration rate of that cohort was. Anybody want to guess what, what proportion of Māori men who were born in 1956 were in prison? Too high, yeah? Just give me a number, any number. 10. 74%. Right. You cannot understand what is happening excuse me, to our, my, my grandparents until you understand what they went through. And that's invisible. Those regional differences are invisible. But also, a lot of the information we have is about individuals, and of course we operate in a collective model or in a regional model, and the measures don't necessarily, uh, might be about outcomes, but we actually want things about capability for change. But two things we can really easily address, accessibility, right? That's easy, right? And the other thing we have to be aware of as statisticians and analysts is that there is a precision issue. We start dealing, doing that analysis about Māori statistics, um, it's, uh, we're using Māori data, especially if we want to play that at a regional level, right, you start ending up with small n problems. Okay, and so precision is important. Now that doesn't mean you don't do it, but it just does mean you have to report on it. So if we have a, have a look at about a whole lot of Māori um, advancement parameters, and I'm not going to go through them all, right, but if you then, then put that as a, as a matrix up there and look about how do those parameters mesh against the provided data and our New Zealand's world-leading integrated um, data infrastructure, they don't mesh very well at all. Okay. And that actually has some significant risks. And the first is we're going to actually miss that Māori advancement dividend. And the second is there's going to be a system backlash. Because data collection without reciprocity looks, begins to look like a lot like surveillance. And we've been there before. So when I say there's a potential demographic dividend, um, it's a big one, right? And it's important, and it's important not only for Māori, it's important for New Zealand. Um, our median age is uh, about 24 years, I think it's 23.9 years. Um, and what that means is that we actually have a very, very young population, and unlike the rest of the population, we are never actually going to hit the stage where we have more people under the, uh, over the age of 65 than we have under the age of 14. So the, what that means is the lessons that we learn from today's data, we can actually use in a really effective way for prevention, because a big chunk of our population are yet to go through those experiences. Right? So this is really important for us. And if you're wondering what that little red line is just above the word Māori, that is actually the number of us there were in 1896. Right? So you can see the change that's happened in our population. So, um, there's a whole lot of people, um, including myself and some people in this um, room, who are moving into, into using data. But it's actually, how can we engage and benefit from the existing data resources? And that means we need data that matches our aspirations, and we need to start removing some of the um, skill and technological barriers to engaging with those, datas, that, those data. And we need to start thinking about what is the, the process of this engagement, right? Is it based on social licence, this kind of passive, you haven't complained yet approach, or is it the basis, basis of partnership or ownership and control? Because the top-down approach that we've actually had so far hasn't delivered. 
And because it hasn't delivered, right, it, um, yet, I think we need to look at what, something that's different, and we need to look at something that's different, um, that is based on a treaty model, so that is engaged partnership. However, there are some good news stories, right? It's not just me getting upset about um, <laughs> what's happening to our old people. There have been some fantastic news stories, uh, good, good news stories. One is the wider asthma project, a data-driven data intervention, lasted six months, had a six-year effect on reducing asthma um, admissions for that Māori community that, that did it. Uh, Wahakura, these uh, woven bassinets um, or sleeping pods, pepe pods, um, that was another community intervention, again, data-driven, and it was shown to be just as safe as bass necks, and it's now routinized. But there's a whole lot more. Um, the CDH gene discovery, discovering the gene f that for uh, familial, or what used to be called sporotic, uh, sporadic gastric cancer, um, that was a partnership between Māori and non-Māori, where the Māori knowledge that contributed to that partnership meant that what was expected to be a three-year research project was a four-month project. Um, because Māori, we were, um, the whānau were able to turn up with the genealogical information. There is a fantastic Māori-driven um, da and data-informed community development initiative, the one of the architects of which is sitting in the middle of the room. I won't point her out, because um, she'll hit me. Um, and, uh, but th th that is a community-driven and um, data-informed development initiative um, that is operating from the ground level. Genomics Aotearoa are looking at creating a viriome, a Māori and Polynesian viriome, a reference vi uh, viriome, so that um, with a specific intent at looking at the, addressing the potential inequity and inherent in um, genetically and in, in genomic informed medicine. Whānau Tahi is a Waikoreda initiative that is creating a whole new way of processing data and organising data around whānau. Um, collectives rather than just family collectives. And the National Science Challenge are investing big time in technology and support for, uh, for Māori data and data sovereignty. So what is Māori data sovereignty? It's the right of Māori data to access, use, um, have con governance and control over Māori data. And leading the advocacy for this is Tamana Rarangu, of which I'm a founding member, as is Rawiri, as is Kiri Pōwhai. Um, and basically, we're, we're advocates. Right? And we're advocating for Māori da data rights and interests, data governance, data storage and security, and data access and control. And in doing that, it's an intent of actually improving things, right? So that we and there's a um, we have a charter, and we have some principles of what Māori data sovereignty is, and that is looking at the authority to collect and maintain data, the relationships inherent in data, um, and data protection, the obligations of data holders and data users. The fact that this has to be for collective benefit, not for individual benefit, and uh, for reciprocity that there is actually um, recognising that you're actually dealing with something that was provided by somebody else, and that people using this data are actually uh, dealing with something very precious. It is much more detailed, but if you want to see more on that, check out the website. Data sovereignty is not just a New Zealand thing. Um, there's a fantastic book um, being published by ANU Press that is free to download. But basically what it does is says that um, Data is subject to the laws of the nation from which it is collected, and that includes tribal nations. It's international, as I say. There's a group here in New Zealand, um, the United States um, Indigenous Data Sovereignty Network operating out of the University, or based at the University of Arizona. There's another group in Hawaii. Um, there's an Australian group, and there's emerging networks in um, Canada and Sweden, although some of the Can Canadian tribal nations are well ahead of us in this regard. So what do we do as analysts? How do we address this? Okay, because um, there is a lot of potential here, and I want to um, you walk away with thinking that yes, w there is a, a, a potential that we don't don't realise the benefits. But if we actually do what is right, things like could actually be pretty good. Well, first of all, is um, we have to look at the adequacy of the data that we're looking at. Are the, all the variables there? Right? It drives me crazy as a research reviewer, seeing people wanting to do um, impacts or assessments of genetic risk for various, usually cancers, and they're using ethnicity data, in which case they're missing out on 14% of the Māori population by descent. Ethnicity is not a phenotypic or genotypic um, variable, it's a, soci uh, it's a sociological variable. Um, so are there key, key um, variables missing, like the cohort effect with, um, with Māori men? Has there been differential exclusion from records? You, know, you get these you know, 
these records and uh, although there's a unique identifier there that the name's been misspelt or the address keeps changing and so you end up with you know those people are pretty hard to uh, fit in the model and if you don't do lots and lots of data management especially you know if you've got millions and millions of cases those people tend to get bumped from your model or guess who they are right so you actually have to make sure that you're not differentially um, inducing some biases or um, major biases um, by excluding people from records and is this stuff actually suitable for predictive modeling right and Again, we come back to the cohort effects, but also there are big regional differences in governance and, and Māori community organisations in New Zealand. So just because it works nationally doesn't need necessarily mean it's going to work in that particular area, in a particular area at a particular time in the future. And of course, we need to always assess the limitations of our algorithm. Who does it work best for? Right? That doesn't mean you put your ethnicity variable in your model. Right? Please or you can do that, but the next step is actually run the, run the, um, and the, run the model separately right, on your um, subsample that is of that particular ethnic group. Right. See what's happening differently for them. Because right. right. not only will you actually be having some richer analysis, you'll actually be creating something that somebody can use, rather than just saying, oh, there's an ethnic difference between Māori and non-Māori in my model. And then when you're doing this, is actually saying, well, who are the audiences, right? And what interventions does this inform? Now, that's really important because if we do things, use variables like the New Zealand DEP index, which is fantastic, right, as a marker of poverty, right, because it's a geographic variable, it's inherent that the response to that is actually what you need to do is move to a higher decile area, okay? Um, so what does it mean for those applying data? We actually have to think different, right? We've been looking at this amenable mortality stuff in 19, since 1975. Things haven't changed, right? More, more of the same isn't going to work. We need to actually focus on those disparities, right? Or we risk making them worse. Right? This could be yet another technological example of Hart's inverse key law, where the benefits of the, of the new technology go to those who least need it, right? And so what we're trying to do is um, then suggest that analysts need to partner with change to, and uh, change disruptors. And this means that we actually have to start looking at changing what we mean by outcomes, changing what we mean, mean by determinants, and looking at how we do measurements and assessments, governance structures over data, and timeframes. And a focus on action is required. Because you know, we're doing this to make a difference, and that difference means change. And that change means we also need to start looking at changing the data system. And the, the EV Chairs Data Leadership Group is leading this. Um, that means that when we're looking at Māori specific outcomes, we need to actually support locally driven innovation to make, meet local need. But when we're looking at those universal outcomes, that kind of routine and equity model uh, work that I've been describing shouldn't be the realm of soft-funded researchers, it should be the first cab off the rank once that data is collected. Right? So that we can all see that the work that they we're doing, whether or not that's actually had an impact um, on, on that inequity as it's been measured. So that means we need to look at you know, changing what's measured, who can access it, how it's analysed, um, and, and how, it's, um, it's, how, how it is accessed. And built, at the same time, building some Māori data capability and, and technology. Because if we don't do different, I have a real fear that we'll, um, all of these advances at national level data right, won't actually deliver positive change for Māori. And I think there is a real benefit, but it's not going to happen by accident, and you're the people who can make it happen. Please prove me wrong. Thank you. <laughs>